Kempfer was witnessing a changing way of life in Japan that would soon shake the very foundations of this highly ordered society. The samurai weren't allowed to engage in trade, so the merchant's standard of living was rising while that of the samurai was falling, and that was just not appropriate for Tokugawa society where the samurai were the top class. The samurai were the elite ruling class, less than 10% of the population. In Tokugawa, Japan, one was born a samurai, and only a samurai had the right to carry two swords. Obligation and loyalty to one's daimyo master formed the basis of their warrior code. But now, in an era of peace, the once privileged samurai faced an uncertain future. There were no wars to fight, and many daimyo found it difficult to keep a full army on staff. While higher level samurai could find work as civil servants, other samurai were not allowed to work in occupations considered beneath their class. An increasing number of unemployed samurai, called ronin, wandered the countryside looking for a new master. The search for new opportunities led many to the cities. And there was no more rapidly growing city than Edo, later to be known as Tokyo. Edo was the capital of the Tokugawa shogunate and Dr. Kempfer's destination. Here he would finally come face to face with the shogun, the most powerful person in Japan. When Dr. Kempfer arrived in Edo, he was sequestered in guarded quarters for two weeks. Finally, he was summoned to appear at the castle of the fifth shogun, Tokugawa Tsunayoshi. The shogun's residence is spacious with many long corridors and large rooms, which can be closed off by sliding partitions. According to the finest design of Japanese traditions, the ceilings, beams, and pillars, patterned by nature, covered with lacquer or carved and gilded artistically into patterns of birds and foliage. The important thing about the fifth Tokugawa shogun Tsunayoshi was that he was the first shogun who was not educated as a samurai. Uh, he was educated as a scholar because he was never supposed to become shogun. And so he had a, quite a different view of the world. The shogun's mother was a merchant's daughter. She broke class barriers when she caught the eye of the reigning shogun. Her son, Tsunayoshi, carried within him both samurai and merchant values. He would preside over a new direction in Japanese society. At his court, scholarship rather than martial prowess was the fashion, and daimyo lords who wished to curry favor with him became patrons of the arts and letters. It was a time of cultural flowering in Japan. Tsunayoshi changed samurai society. He condemned violence, which of course was part of the samurai ethic. Influenced by his childhood study of Buddhism and the Confucian classics, the shogun's laws of compassion were intended to protect all of nature's creatures. Tsunayoshi's laws of compassion protected those at the bottom of the social scale. He had laws against infanticide, and that is quite advanced. Uh, children were abandoned when parents couldn't no longer feed them. They were simply left to die. But Tsunayoshi ordered that from now on, officials had to take care of them, feed them, and find homes for them. 
But Tsunayoshi was also known for lavishing the national treasury on his own pleasures, and he began to pursue his reforms to harsh and unpopular extremes. Born in the year of the dog, Tsunayoshi issued strict laws protecting dogs. The samurai kept large number of dogs in their mansions, and uh, those who were not wanted were let go and roamed the city and often attacked uh, children. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be responsible for a dog, but he, of course, could not order that these dogs be killed. He ended up building dog pounds, and apparently there were eventually some 40,000 dogs which were fed in dog pounds, and of course the feudal lord, the daimyo, had to pay for that. Tsunayoshi would become known as the dog shogun. Dr. Kempfer observed with humor. When dogs die, they are carried up the mountains and buried no less carefully than people. A certain farmer laboriously carrying his dead dog up the hill complained to his neighbor about the year of the birth of the shogun. The other replied, my friend, let us not complain. If he was born in the year of the horse, our load would be much heavier. It was the dog shogun who Dr. Kempfer was finally summoned to meet. After a month-long trip and two weeks of waiting, Kempfer was so impressed with the experience, he drew sketches to illustrate his account of the command performance. After we had been drilled for two hours, he ordered us to take off our cloaks, to dance, to jump, to play the drunkard, to speak broken Japanese, to sing. At the demand of the shogun, we had to put up with providing such amusements and perform innumerable other monkey tricks. Engelbert Kempfer and the fifth shogun shared one thing, and that was a great curiosity. But at the audience, the shogun sat behind a bamboo screen. And he asked Kempfer to come close to the bamboo screen, even take his wig off and dance and sing for him. And Kempfer strained his eyes to be able to see what the shogun looked like and his wife's behind the bamboo screen. But they never were able to talk to each other directly. The shogun and the doctor would meet only three times, but each provided a brief glimpse for the other into his world. Kempfer's account of Japan became a bestseller. It first appeared in English, then it was translated into Dutch, French, several translations, even Russian. And basically, all knowledge until the 20th century was based on Kempfer's so-called history of Japan. Japan had no desire to open its doors to the West. The country was at peace, but the economy was in decline. Thousands of disenfranchised samurai warriors would keep the nation on edge. By the beginning of the 18th century, Edo was probably the largest city in the world, with over a million people. Unlike the European capitals, its citizens enjoyed a safe, clean city with an advanced recycling program. And it was prosperous beyond measure. Copper coins flow like currents of water, while silver piles up like drifting snow. Every morning, fish are sold in such quantities that one may well wonder whether or not the supply in the seas has been exhausted. Visible in the distance is Mount Fuji rising in all its magnificence against the horizon. 